May God add his blessing. I can't wait to hear this sermon. <laughs> little awkward stepping up here in my gender after that. Anybody have some strong feelings from these scriptures, especially after having just baptized Caroline and Fern, right? So here's one of the greatest gifts that we can give each other and to give Caroline and to give Fern is a way to go through conflict and a way to understand difference and a way to give room for that and to work it out in a way that everyone grows no matter what position is taken. And as we go into next week and our general conference where we will be deciding um, and voting on human sexuality and whether or not we ordain LGBTQ plus persons and whether or not we marry LGBTQ plus persons, this week we will be looking at another conflict in the church over women's ordination that did not result in schism. And next week we will be looking at a conflict of the church, slavery and racism that did result in schism. And we will be praying our way through this um, time. And nobody wants these times to be here. Nobody wants this level of conflict present. Nobody wants everyone to get hurt in one way or another because no matter which way the decision goes, there is always someone who is hurt and who feels left out. And so as we come to this time, we come to do hard work. We come to do work that we would rather avoid, but if we can learn to do this work in all the spiritual fruit that Paul mentions, if we can take this as training ground and as practice, then we will grow a witness of faith. We will grow a depth of love and peace and righteousness and justice that is not possible otherwise. Because as Pushpa alluded to earlier in her testimony, it is through Paul's words, he had it spot on, that when we come against these times, there will be suffering. And what will make all the difference is what we do with that suffering if we use it and we turn it into perseverance and let God turn that perseverance into character, we will find hope. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Now, Confermans, are you ready? Because you got a pop quiz coming on the quadrilateral. So start racking your brains and, and, and thinking through. Okay, just kidding. All right, then you got a teaser. Oh, look, saved by the teacher. How about that moment? All right. So when we come to conflict, and when we come to conflict in scripture, it gets really dicey. Um, but we're going to start with scripture, and in the words of my Hebrew Bible professor, Denise Dombowski Hopkins, we're going to look at the black fire, what the words themselves say, and we're going to look at the white fire, what the words point to but don't especially specifically say. And so if you look at these two passages that we read, in the very same book, one is saying, right, that I can't be speaking here up front in front of you because that's disgraceful. If I want to learn anything, I need to go home to my husband and ask him. And thank goodness I have a husband one. And But who knows if he knows. So that'll be interesting when we get back home, Abraham. Especially since I have a degree in this. Anyways. Um, so, and then in that very same book... It's talking about women's, um, women covering their head or not covering their head. Now, we're not going to get into the gender associations of long hair, whether it's shamefulness or whether it's glory and the binary stuff that went on in that passage there. We'll leave that for another discussion for another day. But what that passage is assuming is that women are praying and prophesying in the church. Because if you're debating on whether or not the woman's head is going to be covered or not, it is assuming that the woman is up there speaking. So in the very same black fire of the very same book of the Bible, we have opposites. We have a contradiction. And what's interesting is both of these black fire moments use black fire from the Hebrew Bible, right? Because this is Paul writing a letter. And what is Paul's scripture? What scripture does Paul have to use? 
the Hebrew Bible. And so he's going back to that. And so there's also white fire in the black fire. How awesome and complex is this already? And we're just a couple minutes in. Yeah, this is hard stuff, but it's also fascinating and curious stuff. So we're going to have a white fire moment now, and we're going to turn to other letters of Paul. And we're going to look at Romans chapter 16 that introduced Phoebe to you, a servant of the church. There are other um, translations that say minister and others that say deacon, because what's the Greek word for deacon, Bill? Diakonos. And who are you, Bill? Right. And who is Phoebe? <laughs> oh, wait, a deacon. And she's entrusted with the letter of Romans. And this letter she is sent with Phoebe to Rome to introduce Paul to Rome and the mission work that he wants to do. Is that kind of a big deal? Yeah, it's a big deal. Because you're not going to send someone to introduce you and the ministry you're hoping to build, right, that you don't have faith in and that, and that um, would not be esteemed otherwise. And so we've got a white fire moment here of, okay, we have this 1 Corinthians passage of women called to be silent, but yet here's a woman in a very critical leadership role. All right. And then we have Prisca and Aquila. Now, even though Aquila ends with an A, that's a man, a husband. This is a husband-wife team. Prisca is also um, referred to as Priscilla in other letters. It's the same duo. My co-workers in Christ Jesus. It's not Aquila, my a coworker plus one, because how many churches like two for the price of one back in the day when they got a male pastor and then the pastor's wife also in everything that they thought that they could get? No, no funniness? Okay, it's kind of funny. All right, this is plural, both of my coworkers. So already he's recognizing. And then if we go back to Acts in chapter 16, we have a story of both Prisca and Aquila again taking a guy aside and correcting him and filling him in and what he's been teaching and what he's been missing. This isn't guy to guy having a moment while um, Prisca and Priscilla is doing the Martha work of getting the dinner ready, right? Remember Mary listening with Jesus' feet and being a part of the teaching. So here's the thing. We have this black fire, we have this white fire. And then, not just in 1 Corinthians, but in Timothy as well, is more black fire to the contrary. And 1 Timothy is very clear about drawing from the story of Adam and Eve, and it was Eve who fell to the tempter, not Adam, and so therefore it's Eve who gets punished and not being able to speak in public because she can't be trusted. And because one woman can't be trusted, all women can't be trusted. I know I'm biased, I'm sorry. I'm up here, it's really hard to separate the bias. Um, so here's the thing when we come to scripture and black fire and white fire. If we take a literal view of scripture that every word is God's divine word and the truth that God wants for us to have, then we don't study the white fire. We don't look at the context from which these words came, the history, the culture. It's just that black fire and just that word. And that's okay. What's not okay is not being aware of what commands you give priority over others. So if you're gonna take a literal view, then your work is to take that literal view consistently. And your work is to be aware of what commandments you prioritize in following and what commandments you don't, because we can't follow all of them. It's too large, there's too much, especially taking all the Bible together. And the biggest piece of that is you're going to have to know what ones are the deal breakers for you in associating with the body of Christ and doing this journey together and what ones aren't. Because in Leviticus and the Holiness Code, and this is going to sound trite, but I do not mean this so, because if you take a literal view, then every commandment means that there is truth in it from God. And we follow that whether we know God's truth in it or not, because we trust that it is there. So when we're told not to eat shrimp, or when we're told to not wear garments made of two different kinds of um, fabric, those are commandments as well as these commandments um, that have stirred more conflict with regards to the role of women. 
and these conflicts with regards to the role of win women have traditionally been more of a deal breaker than the garment conflict and commandment has been. But that doesn't mean there aren't whole vocations and professions of people who come to your wardrobes to check scientifically microscoped, like testing the whole nine yards, whether that clothing piece is a single fiber or not. So part of this is knowing ourselves and from that awareness, being able to come at that um, and speak to that in the way that it relates to our shared life together and the way that our personal call affects how we relate and how we do this journey together because no one can do it alone, no matter what scriptural interpretation we take. And then for those who do not take a literal view of the Bible, who believe that it was authored by humans but inspired by God, and that that human authorship does include then some room um, for getting it wrong because it comes from our own limitation of uh, an infinite truth, then the white fire does count and does matter. And the study of the historical context is critical, especially in the letters that Paul writes and learning what the situation was at the time, because if these are directions to a church here that's veering off here and needs to get back on the path here, that works if you're coming at it from this way, right? But if you're coming from the other way and you follow Paul's call to turn right, then you're gonna end up even further away from the path of God that Paul was trying to bring others back to. And so if we, those who believe scripture in this way, what we have to make sure we do is that we actually do the study, <laughs> that we don't just treat it like a monopoly get out of jail free card and just say, oh, well, that's probably a human limitation piece. It means that we take some time to delve into the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic to learn original language. It means that we look with archeologists and our theologians and our scholars who have done the work to learn the context, to know what was meant um, at that particular time. And then, and only from then, we make the applications to life today, and we do so in humility, knowing that we do so from our own limitation as well, right? Because that's the key. If we're here recognizing human limitation back then, then we also have to recognize it right now in us and always give room for grace because this is all of us as finite creatures trying to arrive at an infinite truth, which means we're all gonna get something wrong. So how do we help each other learn and grow into a greater and greater truth and to a greater and greater understanding of God? And especially how do we do that if scripture itself in the place that we turn to is in contradiction? And this is where John Wesley also asks us to turn to tradition and to reason and to experience and to use those as we go through scripture. And so in tradition and, and finding our women's place, and I'm just gonna go through this very shortly. Um, John Wesley struggled with that too. Um, and there was a certain woman preaching at the band meetings that wasn't supposed to that Mary. Um, and had all of the scriptures that we just read from Timothy and Corinthians launched at her of how dare she do this. And she wrote a letter to John Wesley with this quote. I do not believe every woman is called to speak publicly, no more than every man to be a Methodist preacher. Yet some have an extraordinary call to it, and woe be to them if they obey it not. What we're asking for, right? is an openness to pursue God's call. If God calls, how will the church respond? How do we honor a personal call from the Holy Spirit and go with it? And so for John Wesley, this was enough. And it was not enough to change his policy on allowing female preachers, but it was enough for him to give a margin of humility of extraordinary call of knowing that he is finite and that he might not get everything that God is doing. And just to be sure, he's definitely not gonna stand in God's way. And so Mary keeps preaching and we keep working it out. And in terms of our denominations, just so that you know, um, there, you know what, I'm gonna skip that. <laughs> 
because it takes a little bit long to explain because there have been so many mergers and splits. Um, so just know that in uh, 1968 was when there was full ordination um, for all women in all of the different denominations that came in the merger that make up the United Methodist Church. And we can talk more on that later. And when we go to tradition, I just shared United Methodist tradition. Please don't be limited to that. If this were a study and we had more time, we would be looking at the early church. We would be looking at both the Greek and the Roman church, and we would be, we would be expanding the view of tradition. Experience. One of the best um, aspects of the itinerant system was how it worked our church through this conflict over women's ordination because there were plenty of churches after that ordination was affirmed and passed that said, do not send us a female pastor. But we have an itinerant system where the bishop sends pastors um, to the churches. And so what happened is that we became one of the denominations that integrated female preachers um, in, I mean, it wasn't easy, but comparatively speaking, um, in, in a very helpful way because all of a sudden we were there. And then, and then there was a chance for some to change and of course for some to not, but there are stories upon stories of my colleagues of what happened when they were by the bedside and when they were living into their calls as pastors and when there were parishioners who were able to receive that and how that changed, how they felt about ordination because they too experienced the call of God and saw that firsthand and they, like John Wesley, got out of the way of that call. And there are other times where that doesn't happen, where there's an experience of call and that, that doesn't change a person's belief. And, and here's the thing, even with gathering statistics from reason and walking all of this through, like at Wesley Theological Seminary, the total number of students there is 62% female and 38% male. And even given all of this and 63 years of affirming women's ordination and full clergy rights, 63 years of this issue being quote unquote settled in our church, there are still people and churches who ask to not have female clergy be appointed to their church. There are times when there are gonna be irreconcilable differences in our world, in our lives, and in our faith journeys. And so the question is what we do with them. And so what I would ask for us is to let go of the end of whether or not where we land in this conflict of whether or not we ordain or don't ordain women. And what I would like to focus on is how we deal with this conflict and the process of it. And what I would ask for us today for this conflict as we engage it and for the conflict around sexuality is that we not waste it. Is that we use this moment, however hard and how uncomfortable it is, to do the extra study, to read scripture more, to talk, to study and research the tradition, to reflect on our own personal experience, to grow our faith. So that no matter what happens, God was able to use this moment to bring forth a greater depth and a greater connection and a greater witness. Because it is in these moments of conflict and of pain that our witness will be the greatest. But it is up to us whether that will be something that turns people away from church forever or draws them in even more. Sarah, would you join me up here? There happens to be this other chapter in 1 Corinthians in the middle of all of this that we would like to read for you. You got it? Okay, kick us off. I'm going to hold it for you. Love never fails. As for prophecies, they will be brought to an end. As for tongues, they will stop. As for knowledge, it will be brought to an end. We know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, it is partial. What is partial, partial, will be brought to an end. When I was when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child. 
think like a child. But now that I have become an adult, I have put an end to childish things. Now we see a reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know partially, but then I will know completely in the same way that I have been completely known. Now, now faith, faith hope, hope, and love remain. These three things, and the greatest of these is love. Amen.